countries. And, you know, through kind of researching it, my, you know, this was obviously right at the height of the 2016 election, you know, and I was at kind of peak uh, election fatigue and politics fatigue. And, you know, and it kind of dawned on me, you know, what would things look like if you just started from scratch? And, you know, this sort of morphed into an idea of, I was like, you know, what if I do a travel show where I basically go to all these different micro nations and sort of interview these people about their utopias, you know, and, and how they kind of imagined what a utopia looks like. And, you know, I, I talked to a couple people and what I found was, you know, for the most part, these micro nation um, sovereigns are basically you know, they're either interested in like dressing up in silly clothes and kind of designing a flag or avoiding taxes. You know, those are kind of like, that's, that's, that's <laughs> or more both. or less, or, <laughs> yeah. or both. And, you know, and, and also there's some artists that have done this as well, and they've done kind of interesting things. But then I, you know, I ended up speaking with Jeremiah and, you know, I just kind of realized, honestly, within about five minutes of speaking with him that he, you know, this guy, this is a guy who is, you know, a real sort of classic autodidact and had really, really researched this, you know, in a really kind of intense way. And he had a really interesting perspective. And, you know, from there, I kind of realized that we could just make a whole film about him. Right. I I mean, you said so many things there, there, (laughs) I want to take off track and I I'm going to for a second before we come right back to your film, but because I had no idea that that's what sparked your original interest, which Um, This whole idea of a utopia, I remember Sonia Johnson, who's a radical feminist, um, ran for president in 82. Um, She was a Mormon housewife before that and wrote Mm -hmm. a book from housewife to heretic. And then Mm -hmm. she she became an activist. Then she ran for president. And then finally, she she stopped it all. And she said, the more that I'm an activist and she was part of that women's rights movement, the more I do that, the more patriarchy can shore up whatever I'm pummeling at them and fight back. So she Mm -hmm. started to talk about dissolving all patriarchy internally and Mm -hmm. this utopian place that she would live in. Because she said, I looked around the world and there was nowhere that I saw that if I had created, it would look like that, like nowhere. And so just listening to you speak, I'm going, okay, that like that whole theme is there's something so exciting about that fresh start. And, and I yep. kind of want to ask you, what would, what would it look like? Did you land in some place for yourself, <laughs> personally, either of you, where you went, okay, for starters, there's this. Did you ask yourself that question? God, I mean, that is, that's, that's a very big question. It is. <laughs> <laughs> and it's only a sidebar because you're going to get right into the movie. That was just a I mean, no, I I think it's a good, I think it's a good question. I mean, you know, it's like, I would say that, you know, I think that the problem in general with utopia and maybe governments in general, right, is that you start from this philosophical place that is really pure, you know, like, I think it's like, if you read the Bill of Rights, it's a really beautiful, pure document. And the problem with all government is people. You know what I mean? And that's, you know, and like, I think that's sort of like, I actually think that that's a real theme of the film as well, you know? And it's like, you can approach something with the purest intentions. And I think when you get human beings involved and you give human beings either power or money or both, I think that that drastically, uh, I think that drastically corrupts, you know, any sort of kind of idealism. Mm-hmm. Which we're that's my get- that- which we, which we will certainly get to. I mean, Brett, do you have anything to add to that? No, I, I mean, I think I'm just thinking about kind of where, where I was at like emotionally at the time when we started working on the movie. And I think that was time just of like, it, there wasn't, a, it was more despair than like thinking about, uh, it was more just like, how did we get here and what's going on? Um, what a having, mess. Yeah. Than yeah. having much uh, capacity for, for imagining, um, like a more peaceful version of, of the world, unfortunately. So I think, uh, so I'm just like kind of transported back to that moment where everything seemed pretty dark. Um, 
I feel I feel like like idea number one at that moment was like escape. Like, how do we escape? I mean, you guys are Vancouver based. I mean, I mean, I remember my father was, you know, really like at this moment. You know, my father is a uh, you know a long time progressive, and you know he's always kind of saying stuff. And he was act. I mean, he was really for a moment looking at like what would it take to become a Canadian citizen. <laughs> I mean, it was really kind of like you know, it was kind of dramatic to that degree that, you know, I definitely had never experienced in my lifetime before. And, you know, yeah. he was, he was taking it really seriously, the idea of potentially leaving. Yeah. I think for a lot of people, it was so shocking that that, that became a, a reality going, how did we get here and how do we get out? Yeah. Okay. Let's segue back into the film. Tell us about, he, fa- the, he found some land. I mean, that in itself is remarkable. It's between a tiny sliver of Africa that, um, is not ruled by anybody. I wonder if you can give us a bit of info on the history. Um, how come Egypt, neither Egypt nor Sudan want to claim this little sliver? Sure. So um, the area that he, so basically just in the, the two sentence story, he basically found this piece of land online, like, like everything happens. And he basically just flew there and got a permit from the Egyptian government and planted his flag. And, you know, and the history is that basically it's this, uh, as you said, a 500,000 square um, acres of land in between Egypt and Sudan and the Nubian desert. And this is a piece of land that is, you know, about 120 degrees uh, Fahrenheit year round. So it's a living nightmare. There's no access to water. And, you know, the, the history is that basically, you know, the whole region, Egypt and Sudan, was the British uh, protectorate of, of Egypt, Sudan. And, you know, it was obviously it was run by colonial power. And what happened was, you know, as colonial powers are totally, you know, uh, totally insensitive to the details on the ground, they basically... Uh, just decided like, okay, we're going to split this land in half. We're going to call one Egypt. We're going to call the other Sudan. We're just going to draw a straight line across the desert. You know, like that'll be the easiest thing. We're not going to talk to anyone. Why would we? We're British, you know, we're colonialists. They're not, we don't consider them to be human beings. Yeah. And, you know, so in 1899, they did that and they, they drew a, they drew a line on the 22nd parallel. And, you know, basically what happened was um, a couple of years later, Obviously, people did live there and they were human beings and, you know, traveling through this desert was their home and they were, uh, you know, they were herders and uh, there was several, you know, there were several tribes, there was also towns and this straight line border, you know, really screwed up their lives, you know, and that's, you know, obviously the, that's the story of much of the world and a lot of the problems we have, you know, these completely arbitrary lines that colonial power is through. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in 1930 or 1903, they, you know, made a sort of lazy attempt to remedy it. And they sort of drew kind of more of a crooked line, which sort of accounted for um, the grazing, uh, the grazing patterns, you know, of the tribes that lived there. And, you know, kind of, you know, to this day, pretty much what this, uh, you know, and maybe we can put an image or something on the site after the call so people can actually see what we're talking about. But what this sort of did was it created kind of a figure eight. And um, in order to, you know, there's another piece of land called the Halayab Triangle, which is on the coast and it's worth more money. So basically Egypt and Sudan have been arguing over the Halayab Triangle because there's, there's gold there. It's, you know, they can potentially have trade. You know, it's just a place where you can actually live. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, and basically because they are, arguing over the Halayab Triangle, this, they leaves this neglected piece of land, Beer to Wheel, in the middle. And, you know, and for over a hundred years, or, you know, more than that at this point, um, you know, no, neither country has claimed this land, and they've both very actively said that, um, that they do not control it, and it's not theirs. Yeah, so you basically have one, Egypt insisting on one of the original boundaries, like, um, that was drawn across the 22nd parallel, and Sudan, uh, insisting that the, the boundaries actually that the the later um, division so right because if they claim that that land it will negate having the land that everybody wants which is the, the what did you the call Red it the sea. halal 
Yeah. Yeah. The, the Halayev. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, and, no, it's great. And, and there's basically, you know, we've definitely done a good amount of research on this and, you know, as according at least to the academics that we've spoken with, there's actually only one other piece of land in the entire world that um, is unclaimed in this way. And uh, that is, is that in Eastern Antarctica? Europe, kind of. Oh, no, not Antarctica. Antarctica. Antarctica has its own sort of like treaty agreement where no country claims it, but it is, you know, it's unclaimable and it's considered uh-huh. to be international land. Right. Uh, but on the banks of the Danube River, I'm going to be blanking on what uh, what two countries. It's you know one of two countries in Eastern Europe um, is the Austria. only other piece of land. I can't, I can't quite remember it which would one be it is. The Danube, I think. Right? Okay. Yeah, it could be Austria, and I don't know. I, I don't want to. I don't yeah. want to screw this up. But uh, and I, and another person did go and claim land there like ten years ago. Well, my understanding here too is he was not the first to go to Beer Tawal. Have I pronounced it correctly, Tawal? Beer to wheel. To wheel. Um, he's not the first, right? The other people have actually done this, gone, planted flags, keyboard uh, uh, emperors, right, online. But he physically went and stuck this flag in. Was it difficult to get to? Is, is this land pretty inaccessible or tough to get to? I mean, the short answer is yes and very. Uh, you know, pretty much you fly, you fly into Cairo and then you basically, um, yeah, you make your way, you make your way up the coast and then pretty much you're like in the middle of the desert and you're sort of right on the border of, um, you know, of Egypt and, you know, this, you know, basically like a no fly zone, like it's an unincorporated zone in the desert and you have to get special permits to go there. And, you know, Basically, you know, Jeremiah, you know, traveled like hours and hours you know, into the desert in like 120 degree heat uh, to go to go and do this. And actually, and actually, since then, interestingly, they have, um, you know, some. I guess a group. This is actually pretty dark, but a group of Mexican tourists tried to do the same thing several years after um, after Jeremiah had done it. And there was actually a real tragedy. And, you know, this area is kind of known for human trafficking and, and various types of smuggling. So it's patrolled by the Egyptian military. Right. And, you know, somehow the correct permits were not passed to the correct people. And uh, this group of Mexican tourists was they were killed by the Egyptian government uh, by accident because they thought that they were smugglers. Wow. And and basically since then, you can no longer get a permit to go to this place. Wow. Okay. So when, when um, Heaton did this, it was 2014, <laughs> right? When he went and planted his flag, if I got the date right? That's correct. What was the response by the media? What did it generate? Yeah. Brett, do you want to take this? Yeah. Um, so yeah, he kind of posted initially on Facebook, which nobody can do today, but uh, um, uh, he yeah, and it got sort of picked up sort of by the local paper, um, just, you know, sort of like a, a, almost a human interest story, really focusing on, look what this dad, this loving dad did for his daughter. You know, it's so common that little kids ask, like, you know, they see any one of the classic fairy tales and say, I want to be a princess or I want to be a prince. Um, and so, you know, this was his way of, of making that dream come true. And so the uh, you know, local paper kind of wrote it up and then it sort of, it got picked up by um, the Associated Press um, and kind of just made, made the rounds. Um, there was a, at first, you know, sort of a big wave of articles and newspaper and television coverage in the U.S. especially. Um, yeah, sort of lauding him and just kind of a, a very like sweet story of this father doing um, this selfless thing for his daughter. Um, and through that, yeah, he ended up um, basically, Jeremiah ended up um, making a deal with, with Disney to adapt the film or adapt his story into some, um, to a, a couple of future films. And when they brought on a writer, uh, to write those, basically there was a, a big backlash, mostly on Twitter, um, of people just sort of going, Hey, wait, wait a second. Why is Disney making this movie? 
<laughs> about a white man from Virginia going to Africa and planting a flag and claiming piece of land. An African king. Um, and you're like, wait a second, this isn't so cute. You know, so that kind of got shut. Yeah, yeah that um, yeah. that was sort of the end of the media attention. And there were there was a handful and. Um, you know, we spoke to one of the journalists who who covered the story in this way. There, there were just certainly, I think, mostly at that point was sort of the articles or, or coverage being more critical uh, of Jeremiah and what he was doing. Um, but I think initially it was really kind of more of like, isn't this so sweet? Um, like, look what this loving dad. But, but again, like. only in America, really. Yeah. Only no, in course. America. I mean, um, unquestionably. Yeah. Was he surprised that he wasn't? I'm sure he saw himself as a pioneer, as a great dad. And um, was he surprised at this backlash, seeing him as like some sort of imperialist? I mean, yeah, I, I think that I mean, I, I, and I think that this is a major this is a major theme of the film, you know, and a, a major interest that we had in the film and kind of his story. It's that, you know, like he's obviously a really smart guy and um you know, he did this, he did this thing and he, he just didn't, he was just like, these people are getting it totally wrong. Like they're, they're missing the point. Like the thing that I'm trying to do here is I'm first doing this amazing thing for my daughter. Like I'm the world's greatest dad. And on top of that, you know, his plans, at least in the beginning, uh, we can, we can get into kind of what they turned into, but at least in the beginning were, you know, they were, you know, from a very progressive standpoint, you know, it's like he wanted to, you know, create like a big solar energy field and he was going to sell cheap power to his neighbors. He wanted to, you know, build these incredibly technologically advanced vertical farms, which was going to, you know, revolutionize agriculture and try to, you know, uh, you know, feed the world basically and, and, and fight climate change, um, you know, along the way. And he really couldn't wrap his head around why people were so angry. Mm -hmm. And that was, and that was sort of the, that was the initial thing that really made me interested in the story, you know, because he, you know, I think he really was sincerely well-meaning, you know, at least at this point. And I think that, you know, I found it so fascinating, you know, living in a very different media bubble than he did, you know, to me and to Brett, you know, it was extremely obvious why what he was doing, you know, it was problematic. Yeah. Like it was, it was, it was very straightforward and, you know, and he didn't see it that way. And I, you know, because of that, I was, I wanted to have those conversations with him. Right. Yeah. I think, I, I mean, to me, that's sorry, what's so interesting is less that it was a surprise to him and more that it wasn't a surprise to, to some of the bigger news outlets or, you know, um, entertainment companies. True. Um yeah, why, yeah why, 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 why Disney thought this was a good idea? Yeah, that, that, that it didn't occur to anybody else sooner kind of on that, on that front is more the, the shock to me. Um, he was a pretty smart guy. Like, I, I was just impressed with his thinking to even start looking for this piece of land anyways, as he was looking for islands all over the place and everything else, and so persistent. And then yeah. to, to have not seen that. And some of the stuff was so like altruistic, like you were talking about the solar and, and the, you know, the, the farms. What was it that turned for him where, you know, because it, it did get kind of really, you know, lack of a better word coming from Canada, American. Can I just, I, I read an article quoting him where he said, I'm just one human being trying to improve the condition of other human beings. I have the purest intentions in the world to make this planet a better place. And anyone who is criticizing it, saying, you know, I'm a white person sitting in the middle of the Nubian desert, he called that really juvenile. And yeah, I'd love you to comment on, you know, it's what you were saying, Brett, um, how people didn't get it, and not just him, but there are lots of people who didn't get it. The media didn't get it. And then there are people who don't get it, maybe still don't get it. So I don't know if we need to spell it out for our, uh, I don't think we have to spell it out. I mean, to me, it's just so <laughs> obvious, like how, you know, how could you not, but, but maybe you could comment on how come people don't, how come, how, and I guess we're moving toward white privilege. That's where the conversation right this moment is shifting, yeah, I think, because it is like blinders. It is such a myopic view of self and other um, 
And I just, how prevalent do you still think that is, the, the blindness, I guess, in America? I mean- And not just America, actually. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I can only I can only speak for America and I will and I will speak for all of America uh, with this statement. Uh, good. good. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, you know, I mean, having spent a lot of time, you know, with Jeremiah and then, you know, honestly, just totally coincidentally, my wife is a professor. And during COVID, we actually moved about an hour from Jeremiah in North wow. Carolina for the whole year. And this, this had nothing to do with the film and the film was basically finished. So I basically, you know, had already spent a lot of time with him. And then we, then we actually ended up living there for a year. And yeah, I, I think it's a, I think it's a huge blind spot. And I, and I do think that that is one of, you know, I, I think like, I think a, something that we sort of figured out through making the film is that you know, it's like, we're not, we, we're not polemicists. We didn't, we weren't, we didn't set out and we weren't interested in making a gotcha film. And what we kind of discovered through making it is that, you know, sort of like the things that Jeremiah says in the film kind of sits exactly where this fault line is. And it's like, you know, it's like to one audience, you know, like the thing that he said, you know, kind of in this section where we're kind of talking about the colonialism kind of most directly where, you know, he doesn't see color basically. And he went to a church that had, you know, those very multicultural, you know, it's like to, you know, to, to a, what person, you know, to a group of people in one media environment, you know, you immediately hear that and you say, you know, he's, he's missing the point. Like he doesn't, he doesn't understand how this works. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, he watched the film and he, and he says, you got, you know, you got my, you got what I was saying completely right. You know, and he, he, he didn't feel like we were trying to attack him or anything. He was just like, I, it felt like you really truly represented my feelings and my position. And I think that that is, you know, I think that is where the divide in America is right now. And I think that, you know, the key is, you know, I, I think like, you know, I, I think having these conversations with people like Jeremiah is really valuable. And I think it's, it's not, I think it's something that doesn't happen enough. Hmm. Yeah. Right. And I think, yeah, I think part of it too is like, um, or, you know, from that angle, one of the things I think is interesting about Jeremiah's point of view um, is, you know, like I'm a white cis man living in, in the United States of America, they're like, I can guarantee you there's a million blind spots that I have. And those are the things that are, it's not the, it's not the ways in which I recognize my privilege and I'm aware of it that are really dangerous and harmful. I think it's the ways that I am blind to, that, right? That you um, don't see. Yeah. That's, that's, what's actually dangerous and, and hard, so hard to work on because I am, there is, I can guarantee you there's some myopia that I have. Um, and so I think um, for us, especially kind of in the moment, uh, you know, sort of post 2016, where we just really started working on this film, you know, I think that uh, there was a lot of focus on some of the like larger and more violent expressions of sort of white male privilege and sort of this white male insecurity. Um, but I think that Jeremiah, Jeremiah's point of view is much more common um, and sort of much more emblematic of, of sort of a subtler version of that. Um, and I think that that was something I think for me, at least that was interesting about the, his story and the film is kind of, um, yeah, sitting with that a little bit more. Um, cause I feel like that got a little bit less attention, understandably, mm -hmm. um, in kind of the conversation. What's your hope that the film might teach about privilege? Do you have a hope? Do you have an intention there? No, I, I, th I think we do. I mean, you know, I, my intention of the film is like, you know, we really tried, you know, it's obviously very observational in style, but of course we do have a point of view. And I think that, you know, my hope for the film is that, you know, Jeremiah and all of his friends, and he, he has showed, you know, all the people in his life, the film, you know, it's like, it's, you know, I think it's a way to sort of bridge this divide. And I'm, I'm not, I'm obviously not saying that this, this film is going gonna, is gonna to solve the divide in America, uh, far from it. It's, uh, but, I, but I do think sort of, 
you know, really listening to people and hearing where they're coming from is important. And I don't, and I don't think that that happens much right now. Right. And I think that people are so triggered by, you know, the other side that they can't even listen. They just hear this thing and it, it just, you know, it just, it, it, it feels so horrible that they actually can't handle it and they can't take it in. And I think that, you know, my hope is that, you know, people that are conservatives, you know, can watch this film. And I think that the, I think the film is very respectful to their point of view. And I think that they can see it and also see the blind spots. Like that's what we're kind of trying to show. And I think on the other side, I think that I hope that liberals can see this film and say, look, people like Jeremiah are human beings and they love their family and they have some blind spots and they have some really good intentions and they get corrupted by power and money, just like everybody else. You know what I mean? And it's not, and it's, you know, and it's not specific to a certain uh, ideal ideology. Yeah, no, I like that. And I think, I mean, for me as a liberal watching his, I would say brilliance, like he is one determined, uh, amazing human being, some of the things and and that uh, so many people would have given up. And I just kept watching going, oh, if you put that energy toward A, B or C, oh my so gosh, tell me, tell like, me about watch it. out. <laughs> Right, because he, he's it. like he's a force of nature. He's quite remarkable, um, but I like what you're saying because I think this divisiveness, this polarity—it's like a polarity. It gets nowhere. It—that's how wars begin. That's the whole, you know, right. I'm right. I'm right. Like, uh, there has to be something else. And the the alchemy to me of waking up—I think it's why we do this show—is just turn a light on it. Like I, I want to keep my opinions out of it. I don't always succeed for sure. But to me, yeah. turning the light on means the conversation is happening. And yeah. as long as no one's pointing fingers, because it's the same in human relationships, personal ones, right? The root of every conflict in a, in a romantic relationship is that fingers pointed externally and blaming. Well, nobody's going to move anywhere toward any kind of understanding if that's how it begins. And I think it's the same globally. I think it has to be stretching toward understanding the whole as opposed to picking a side. No, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And obviously it's easier said than done. (laughs) Well, I mean, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, I do, I do just, you know, because obviously we've been you know, working on this film in some capacity for four years, right? So it basically spanned the entire Trump presidency. And, you know, and it's like, I'll, you know, I'll be honest, like there were moments where I just felt viscerally angry at Jeremiah, you know, and, and we had a lot of, we had a lot of debates about this. You know, it's like, we're, you know, I, I, I consider him a friend, like we're, we're close, you know, and I was just furious. And he was furious at me, you know, and, you know, and I think that I, you know, I think the only reason that we were you know, able to kind of make it through this is, you know, it's just, we just kept talking and I, and and to Jeremiah's real credit, I think that we are really, we have really different political views. And I actually think that to his real credit, he, he is able to listen. Um, I think he's really actually able to listen and he's able to take criticism. And I think that that was sort of what made this possible. Mm -hmm. Let's move into what happened with that Disney deal. It got dropped. Do you think that had to do with people's response and the backlash that people were giving um, what he was up to? Yes. (laughs) Yeah, that's, yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think the, you know, the real kind of short version of the story is that, yeah, like the writer, uh, you know, posted it on Twitter, you know, and she's a Hollywood, you know, liberal, she's a Hollywood liberal. Uh, and she posted it on Twitter. And um, yeah, there was just like an immediate uproar, as was obviously to be expected. And it, it's just, you know, uh, yeah, it's just so unbelievable. I mean, I would say, interestingly, there was actually a black executive from Disney uh, that was uh, part of the project, which was sort of interesting. And we actually, I tried to do an interview with him. You know, we ended up talking a couple of times, but he was not willing to do it um, on camera. But, you know, like, yeah, just Twitter exploded as Twitter, you know, is known, known to do. To. 
Yeah. And uh, it was totally, you know, a reasonable reaction. It was it's totally insane that they, um, you know, even just from like a business perspective, you know, it's like they could have introduced it in a different way. You know what I mean? It's like they, I mean, it was just such a, you know, it was a PR fail on the, on the most surface level and just a kind of moral failing, you know, on a much, on a much deeper level. Yeah. His his crowdfunding campaign, was that after he started, he was trying to raise 250,000 or something to get the state running? That's a really good question. It was like, right. It was right in there. I know I know that it, I know that it more or less fell apart after the, like, after they got all the grief on Twitter. Like, I, I think that, yeah, I think they launched it and then basically like, you know, all the, the cards, the cards came tumbling down. Uh, I think kind of like right in the middle of that. So Heaton, this sort of changes focus at one point um, and decides this is going to be a nation with industry with military right within a year i think of planting his flag he's trying to access the state department so maybe you can share a bit about that and what happened with michael flynn yeah we'd love to brett do you want to take this one uh yeah no i think it's an interesting i mean really (laughs) well i mean one of the most i think interesting things about the movie and about uh sort of surprisingly or just the number and variety of doors that um opened to jeremiah <laughs> um you know he was in the military he was in the army um so he had some connections there but he um yeah you know he starts kind of poking around and and, and talking to people he lives you know pretty close to dc he has some connections there um and one of the folks who is uh kind of advising him basically says like hey you know the u.s doesn't have really any sort of military presence in Africa, it's there, you know, the military, uh, like basically AFRICOM that runs all the U S military operations in Africa is in Germany. Um, so like, wouldn't that be a great, be a great place to put an American base, you know, have a presence. And there Jeremiah was like, that does though. He was like, he was good. like, he was like, Oh, solar energy. Like, ah, we don't need to do that. Like let's military base, like much better. Yeah. And as a way to, um, you know, I think originally he kind of thought of it as a way to, or to fund some of these other things, or at least purportedly that was the, the aim. Yeah. Um, and yeah, again, just kind of through an insane, and I think, you know, it says a lot about the United States military complex, but the fact that he's yeah emailing basically these incredibly high ranking generals and they're getting back to him and be like, this sounds interesting. You're, it's just mind-boggling so yeah he ends up um yeah meeting uh former general mike flynn at a a military conference and kind of pitching him on this idea and flynn's interested and they have a couple follow-up conversations and this is right before uh mike flynn joins the trump candidacy he's kind of an early early adopter there um and so trump you know goes on to to win quite unexpectedly and Jeremiah is beyond excited because he has this high ranking military official who is now in an extreme position of power to the right of the president of the United States. And then uh, shortly thereafter, uh, <laughs> General Flynn goes to prison for lying to the FBI. Uh, one of the yeah, he, he, actually, he actually does not go to prison. He gets, oh, right. Uh, he got a season debt. Yeah. But, and, but, and then but later he does. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so a bit of a wild ride. Jeremiah is quite disappointed, unfortunately, but, um, not disappointed, but not deterred. Like you couldn't make this stuff up, you know? I mean, like, no. honestly, well, that was one. Is, oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, well, no, please just, go, please. If you can imagine that if this had have actually gone through, what would have happened with Egypt and, and the Sudan is because, you know, it's kind of empty land and you're throwing in world's largest military power all of a sudden right i like, mean were, were they commenting or were they involved in anything anywhere in there so like we at a certain point we like you know we tried to get some answers to this <laughs> you know we reached out to the state department you know because obviously it's just so fascinating and just so insane you know Obviously, we were totally stonewalled. Nobody would talk to us. Not a not a huge surprise. <laughs> but we, um, yeah. I mean, I think you know theoretically. I think the idea was, you know, 
Mike, Mike Flynn would use the kind of, you know, carrots and sticks available to, uh, you know, U.S. government agencies to basically make a deal with Egypt and Sudan and say, look, like, you know, we will we'll give you X amount of aid. We will look the other way about this with this war criminal, you know, whatever, whatever horrible things that the U.S. government is doing on a daily basis. And, you know, they'd say like in exchange for letting us sort of build something on this ungoverned land. And, you know, whether or not that would have actually worked, there's obviously a lot of moving parts. <laughs> I don't know if I'm like, I don't know if I'm so, I don't know if I'm so confident that even had Mike Flynn uh, stayed there, like, I think obviously like, you know, no other president other than Trump would have even attempted something like this. I mean, I think that that goes without saying. So I actually think that like, there is some possibility at least that they would have made an attempt to do something like this. Um, but whether, you know, you know, they, they would have had to get buy-in from Egypt and Sudan. You know, I, I think that is for sure. And without that, you know, they, they were definitely not going to move, you know, they were not going to move in all of this equipment and stuff without buy-in. Yeah. I, I think it was, it seems like from what we've learned, it, it basically feels like, like it was speculative, but like uh, of sort of a, uh, you know, maybe kind of the more hawkish folks in uh, the U.S. government who are a little more fringy were basically being like, "Well, this would be pretty, pretty great for us if this worked out, and maybe it's worth it's worth at least looking into." Um, and those folks happened to be really those voices were being heard more so than usual. Yeah, um, yeah. at that time, like those people are not normally like in direct communication with the president. And in this unique moment in United States history, they certainly were. Yeah. But yeah, but we definitely or Dan and I joke about sort of the like almost like Forrest Gumpian. It's like a bizarro Forrest Gump that Jeremiah just shows up and all these different places where you wouldn't expect him and all these different scenarios. Well, let's let's touch on a few more because this then he moves into his quest for investors. Like, I mean, I, I want listeners also to know that the film is amusing like you laugh while you're watching it it's yeah. disturbing but it's also really entertaining and really humorous at times so i i want to get into this machiavellian approach but that that he had through it because i know at one point he said quote if i can take their dirty money and turn it into good things i'll do it now what do you think of this the impact of a machiavellian approach on the planet i mean can you is it even possible to do good by doing bad? I mean, you know, I have an opinion, you know what I mean? Like I, I, I have an opinion. I, you know, I think, I don't, I don't think the deals with the devil ever turn out well. Obviously they've, people have made a lot of movies about this. They've written a lot of books about this. You know, I think rarely they're like, yeah, I made a deal with the devil. And, you know, it turned out like, maybe, yeah, you know, bad. yeah, like I, I, I give up my first son. We have world peace. You know what I mean? Like that. <laughs> that that's not normally how it works and i don't you know i don't think it would have worked that way uh in this situation either but i but i do think that you know i i i found that to be fascinating and i i spent hours upon hours kind of interviewing jeremiah about this question you know cuz you know and i i think the way that i look at it is less like do these sort of you know do these machiavellian bar answer is no, but I, I think it's pretty interesting to think about, you know, how sort of money and power can sort of like shift one psychology and sort of like, you know, it kind of like starts, it starts small and you're like, okay, like, you know, I'm just going to cut this one corner, you know, and I think it'll be fine. And, you know, and it's like, I'm just going to take this little money, you know, it's like, okay, you know, we're going to take their money, we're going to do good things. So it's like, okay, like, we're going to build a military base, but that's just going to take up a small corner. Like the rest of it's still going to be the solar farm and this, you know, this agricultural Mecca, you know, and just sort of watching how, you know, as he becomes increasingly desperate uh, and I, you know, and I, I do think that that desperation is a real desperation that, that everybody feels right. It's like when you don't have money and, mm -hmm. you know, he was, he was driving a truck to make ends meet and his wife, was a was a elementary school teacher, you know, or maybe a, a middle school teacher, you know, and they were living in rural Virginia. You know, it's like they were worried about money, 
in a real way that many, many people do. And when you are, when you are put in that position, you know, you, there's a desperation and he kind of like, he'd been working on this so long and he kind of like, he'd put all of his eggs in this basket. Like there wasn't, there wasn't kind of like an easy escape valve. There wasn't like, mm-hmm. you know, my rich uncle is going to give me money or whatever. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like he really needed the money. And I think that when people are, people are placed in this situation and, you know, in much less sort of comical and ludicrous situations like this one, you know, that happens every day and people, people make these bargains and, you know, and, and it really generally turns out bad for them, I think. And that's, you know, and I think that, I think that says something more kind of about, you know, how, how uh, like the, the welfare state and the economy is structured, you know, and kind of capitalism as a system mm-hmm. that, that he's, that he was put in this position at all. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think it is also like, yeah, thank you for bringing up that it is uh, an entertaining and, and humorous movie. Cause I do think <laughs> it, it is, is not just, it's not just me lecturing about, <laughs> about capitalism, nature for of capitalism. Two hours. but I, you know, I, I think it is like, um, you know, I think without giving anything away of the movie, it is quite, um, the the journey that he takes from like from what his intention is at the outset to uh where he ends up at the end is a pretty stark criticism of any sort of ends justify the means <laughs> argument i think is yeah, yeah um yeah and it just kind of like a crash course in in uh good and, intentions paving the way to places you don't necessarily i'll like tell that. you where i howled just because i i it was like <laughs> what was when he and that's it all through the movie there were moments where i would do or i'd call it the german german shepherd n- nod you know go, huh? <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> when he goes to china to meet with his investors and he meets now who was that gentleman uh the 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 one that they had a translator for him and he's i think still at the airport but he's meeting some higher up chinese diplomat i guess anyway he says are we going to have real chinese food because <laughs> i really love ginger and i put that ginger salad dressing on all my salads and i'm like what? i love that moment and the way that i, I think that that, that man, that's quite yeah. possibly my favorite moment in the whole film as well <laughs> yeah and and this person who's brought him over who's having this important meeting with the way he, he reacts so politely we're just like oh uh-huh. <laughs> oh but like you love things with ginger on them i, I mean just, yeah, yeah i think it's just you know i think you know to go you know not not to harp too much on the on the uh the white male privilege but you know it's like it's like Jeremiah, you know, obviously had no business being in this situation. He was totally, totally untrained in, uh, you know, this, this type of internet, these mm-hmm. types of international business dealings, you know, and the reason again and again, that he was able to talk his way into these various, uh, you know, settings is, you know, I, I, I will, I, I want to, of course, give credit where credit is due. And he is, a, he is, you know, a world-class talker, you know what I mean? And white, white male or not, he's one of the best talkers in the world. He is a brilliant man, but you know, it's like, I do think that he, you know, really was able to do the things that he did because he was sort of part of these networks and he was only part of these networks because he was a Southern white man, you know? And, and that is, that is a big part of the story and a big blind spot that he has. It's like the way that he got to, to General Flynn you know, was an old army buddy who connected him with like a higher up army guy. And, you know, they're all from sort of like a similar background. They're all from kind of a similar place. You know, they're, they're part of this sort of, uh, you know, network of people. And I, and I think those are the same things that made him attractive to these foreign entities as well. It's like that thick, you know, beautiful Georgia accent that he has, you know, is Mm -hmm. like, the, you know, it's like the quintessential American, you know, expression, you know, and I think that that got him really, really far. And I, and, and I think that had he looked differently, had he sounded differently, he would not have had nearly the, the success just despite, despite being brilliant and insanely articulate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do, do you think part of it too, for him, you said all his eggs were in one basket, but part of it too is saving face, right? It was so public. It was such a big deal. Do you think he had to prove that 
Like, is that part of what pushed him to keep going too? Is that he was going to prove that this was not insane? I, I think, I think a hundred percent. I mean, you know, it's like, I mean, he has, you know, we ended up having a lot more uh, kind of biographical stuff in the movie earlier, uh, in, you know, in earlier cuts that we ended up kind of excising for kind of pacing and time. But, you know, he, he comes from an extremely working class background. You know, it's like, you know, his, I think both of his parents, you know, they worked in like a, like a chicken plant, you know, and kind of everyone in his town, you know, were, they were plucking and skinning chickens, you know, and making whatever a dollar an hour, you know, and he, you know, he picked cotton, you know, as a, as a high schooler, you know, like, so he was this guy, you know, from this community where nobody went to college, you know, nobody had dreams and, you know, he's a brilliant guy and he sort of had you know, he had this sort of, you know, he wanted, he wanted something more for his life. And he always felt like he deserved something more, you know, and he, you know, was really desperate to prove to the world that he was more than this, you know, for lack of a better word, this kind of rural redneck character, right? Mm -hmm. And he, you know, and he was like, you know, I deserve everything that everybody else has. And I, and I want that. And I, I'm going to take a really big swing in order to prove that. And, you know, he's, he's, this is, this is not his only swing. He's taken other swings too. And he, you know, and he wants, you know, this is what he has been desperate to have his whole life. Do you think his vision was cemented on offering freedom from uh, the iniquities of capitalism in a way, or was it more getting away from government interference, having that kind of freedom? Did, did either of those things I, play out for him? I think for him, it's it's definitely economic, and I think that it's it's much less about uh, it's much less about government having too much control, and it's and it's much more about you know I mean it's like he, you know uh, we touch on this a little bit in the movie, and it's you know he he sees you know he sees all the same information that we have, and like you know he says okay the key you know, the key to people being set up for their lives is generational wealth. And he says, I never had generational wealth. And, you know, all these jobs are being shipped overseas. And I want my kids to have opportunities that I didn't have, you know, and, you know, and it's like, you know, like, he's a good talker. Like you can, you can, you can say maybe that's cynical. He just wanted to be rich, but I, but I do, I do really sincerely believe that he cares deeply about making sure that he is everything to his kids, that his parents were not to him and that his kids have opportunities that he never had. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I think that, you know, giving them, you know, part of this whole scheme is like, you know, Basically, you know, it's like for all intents and purposes, he's, you know, it's like he's starting a company, right? And he wants his, he wants his kids to be able to inherit, you know, this company that he has made, that he has built so that they will never have to, you know, they will never have to worry about money for the rest yeah. of their lives. One of, I mean, one of the things I think is so like kind of ironic about the, yeah, there's this, yeah, section in the film where, where he's talking about that and wanting, you know, a better life for his kids. And it's, you know, that is the that's the American dream, right? Like that's what you want mm -hmm. uh, is a better life. You know, that basically your, your children are gonna have more opportunities than you had. Um, but the irony of this is that his way is like, great. So the way to do that is for me to like start my own country. <laughs> like that's the, <laughs> like uh, that's the way to achieve the American dream is starting this other uh, country. So I think there's something um, very uniquely Jeremiah about that. And um, but, I mean, you know, it's like, yeah, it's like Jeremiah, like he has an MBA, like he could just, get a job <laughs> you know what I mean like he could just uh, he could just get like he's smart he's capable like he could just get a job and make you know whatever yeah, hundred yeah, fifty thousand yeah. dollars a year and just you know be comfortable but he that's I think well, he's not capable this, of doing that <laughs> this innovative spirit he's got which he is yeah. he's a bit of a he loves this forward thinking something about yeah. that seems to really excite him so maybe tell everyone what's happening now and, um, you know, with the, with this kingdom, but also where he's ended up because he's doing all right. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, the, you know, like, 
I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ruin the the end of the film, so I'm not gonna tell you exactly what happens with the mm -hmm. kingdom. Um, but uh, check it check it out at the Vancouver Film Festival. But uh, but he, you know, like you know, he's filed a bunch of patents in his life, and he filed this new one, and he actually, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a patent that is for self driving trains, which is a very big innovative idea that probably most of us have never considered. Uh, and he actually ended up getting a Saudi billionaire to invest half a million dollars in this company. And that is what he is currently pursuing. So it's, it's like, you know, the Jeremiah story keeps going and will continue, <laughs> continue on, you know, forever until he dies. I mean, I think that's, you know, that's who he is. And that's... <laughs> Here's the difference, though. Like, I have thought about self-driving vehicles because I really hate driving places. And I thought how cool that's going to be. And plus, I think yeah. about the stock market. However, I'm not doing anything about it. Right. And he does. The fact that he has this idea, he gets this patent and then he gets an investor like he actually has follow through, which is not just a dreamer. He yeah. does things. And I, I think that's the part that was so impressive about his uh, personality, which again, made me go, wow, if you uh, turned it towards humanitarian or altruistic ventures, what, what could we do here? Yeah. Hey, tell me, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a force of nature. That's to be sure. Yeah. yeah that's, that's a great way of putting it. Um, anything we've missed, we're going to, I think, I'm not sure of the time, but we're going to, we're, we're, we're right at uh, towards the end of our time. So Anything you want to say that we've missed about the film to encourage people to get out there? I really want people to see it. You'll love it. It really is entertaining and unusual. So worth seeing and stimulating in terms of conversation also. But well, guys, I'll, I'll, I will be say I, I was shocked as Tash and I have covered VIF for a number of years now when she brought this one to my attention and she kind of told me a little bit about it. She says, you got to watch it. And I, I, I just thought like, Wow, you're interested in this because uh, I, I love the movie myself. I thought Thank it was, you. was so much I could identify Thank with so in much. so many ways of the white privilege and you know persistence and all of those things. And I was actually shocked um, that that Tasha was interested. And in, as we <laughs> talked about it, there was just so much to talk about. Yeah. And you know, just having a fun time listening to you guys and and hearing you know kind of behind the scenes and your experience. So thank you. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Yeah, I would say the only like, yeah, I, you know, I'm biased, obviously, but I do think that there is, there's just, I would say even having listened to an hour long conversation about that, there's going to be stuff if you watch the movie that will surprise you. And yeah. uh, uh, there's, it's just a great story. And he's in uh, Jeremiah is a very, very interesting subject. And um, Danny did a great job directing. Yay. And the premiere is today, actually, right? October 5th, isn't it? at 6 p.m. at VIF Center yeah, and yeah. City Theater. Yes. So that's the live one. And then I know there's another live performance or screening Thursday, October 7th at 345 at Cinematheque, at, uh, also in Vancouver. And the virtual screenings are happening on VIF Connect. And I believe they're happening right now. They've already started. Yes? I think that's, that's correct. correct. Anything you want to add, Danny? No, I just I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much again for such like a great conversation. This was really enjoyable and uh, really interesting. So we really appreciate it. And we're really excited for people to start seeing this movie. We worked very yeah. hard on it. Yeah. Well, and, and one thing, if and when you do, ever do do a follow up documentary on Jeremiah part two, please. He's, reach can out I tell to you, us. he's oh, yeah. he's 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 gunning for it. Yeah. <laughs> he's already <laughs> talked sure about it. <laughs> But yeah, whatever what, yeah keep keep up. us in touch or keep in touch with whatever ventures you get up to in the future this was a pleasure and love to talk to you again yeah thank yeah, you guys so much well. this was lovely we've been speaking with danny abel and brett blake about their film that is um premiering tonight live but online already at the vancouver international film festival the king of north sudan thanks for joining us i'm tasha